This may sound like a strange thing to say, but I am continuously fascinated by the movie Justice League. And as of this video's release, it's now been a full year since Justice League hit theatres, and yet I still find myself thinking about it constantly. The movie was poised to be the crowning jewel of Warner Brothers' attempts to launch a shared cinematic universe of DC properties, hoping that this film would be the same coming out party that Disney and Marvel's 2012 The Avengers was. But what we actually got was this. Oh uh, yeah, oh, something is definitely bleeding. Dressed like a bat. You're out of your mind, Bruce Wayne. When I get the exclusive. Yes, ma'am. Mm. Boxes are, and I'll make it 30. Kalel, no! Here's the thing though it's common knowledge now that Justice League had a ton of behind the scenes production troubles. Warner Brothers and Zack Snyder clearly weren't on the same page in regards to their long term vision, with the studio possibly getting cold feet about the director's ambitions after the lukewarm reception to Batman v Superman. Snyder had to exit the project midway through production after the tragic death of his daughter and his replacement Joss Whedon, the same man who had helmed the Avengers, was brought in to finish Zack's job, but ended up making heavy and noticeable changes to the film. But with all of this said, I feel like the failure of Justice League isn't just on Snyder or Whedon or whoever, I think it's a real systemic problem in regards to how Warner Brothers has handled their comic book and movie properties over the last few years, and the root issue here with Justice League could actually be traced back a decade to even before the unofficially named DCEU was even a thing, during a period that many see as a great one for DC's comic book movies. So in this video, which is the beginning of a three part series, I want to examine the history of the Justice League film project over the last decade. Right now though, we're going to specifically look at George Miller's failed Justice League Mortal film from 2007, and by attempting to understand why it didn't work, we can begin to learn in turn why this didn't work. Created in March of 1960 by Gardner Fox in Brave and the Bold number 28, the Justice League of America are DC Comics' flagship superhero team, initially made up of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Aquaman, and Martian Manhunter. In a modern context, the Justice League still remains one of DC's most beloved properties, with tons of incredibly popular and seminal comic book stories, two hugely popular animated TV series, no shortage of feature-length animated movies, and a wide array of merchandising. So with this in mind, it is weird to think that it took Warner Brothers, who have owned DC Comics since 1989, so long to get this property off the ground and onto the big screen, instead mostly focusing on solo live action features centered around Superman and Batman. The Batman film franchise in particular is incredibly noteworthy. After the critical failure of 1997's Batman and Robin, Warner Brothers began to slow down their production on superhero films, before Christopher Nolan brought the Cape Crusader back to the big screen in 2005 with Batman Begins a much more grounded and comic accurate take on the early years of the Dark Knight, taking heavy inspiration from Frank Miller's graphic novel, Batman Year One. With the success of Batman Begins, Warner Brothers began to develop a number of other superhero properties for live action adaptations. In 2006, Brian Singer, the man who had launched the X-Men film series six years prior, brought Superman Returns, reintroducing the Man of Steel to the movie-going audience with this love letter to the Christopher Reeve era Superman. And with DC's two flagship properties back in the cultural zeitgeist, Warner Brothers began to discuss the possibility of uniting the League. In February 2007, WB announced that husband and wife duo Kieran and Michelle Mulroney had been hired to pen a screenplay for an upcoming Justice League film. The pair submitted their first draft of the film in June of that year, and Warner Brothers were so pleased with their work that they decided to fast track the project, 
bringing in Lord of the Rings producer Barry Osborne to oversee the $220 million film, while aiming to secure Juno director Jason Reitman. However, the filmmaker ultimately passed on the project, which caused the studio then to approach Mad Max filmmaker George Miller, who signed on in September 2007. However, almost from the beginning, the project ran into major problems. For instance, one of the biggest stumbling blocks that it would have to overcome was regarding which versions of Batman and Superman that they would choose to use, and whether or not this film would be tied into Nolan and Singer's respective franchises. While a Superman Returns sequel seemed unlikely at this point, Nolan's follow-up to Begins The Dark Knight was already in pre-production, and the director appeared reluctant to allow his series to become incorporated and intertwined with this new Justice League film. Christian Bale, who portrayed Batman in Nolan's series, was somewhat outspoken about this, stating that in an interview with IESB.net while on the red carpet for 310 to Yuma, not only had he not been approached to reprise his role as the Cape Crusader, but he felt that the film shouldn't be released prior to Nolan's third and final instalment in the series, stating that it'd be better if it doesn't tread on the toes of what we're doing, though I feel like it'd be better if it comes out after Batman 3. Nevertheless, Warner Brothers sought to move forward with the Justice League film, setting a summer 2009 release date and casting the actors who would bring the JLA to life. With a script made up of the team's classic lineup, Warner Brothers found their newest heroes in the form of DJ Katrona, Army Hammer, and Megan Gale as Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, Adam Brody and Common as Flash and Green Lantern, Santiago Cabrera as Aquaman, and Miller's frequent Mad Max collaborator, Hughes Keys Byrne as Martian Manhunter. In addition, Teresa Palmer was brought on to play Talia al Ghul, and Jay Baruchel signed on to play Maxwell Lord. As we touched on earlier in regards to Batman Begins, the Mulroney's Justice League script decided to look at the comic books for their major inspirations, with much of the film inspired by Mark Wade's popular arc Tower of Babel, a 2000 comic book storyline that took place in JLA number 43 through 46, which saw Rachel Ghoul and the League of Assassins steal Batman's secret contingency plans for the other members of the Justice League, allowing them to exercise them to defeat the League while also attempting to reduce the world's population. So, let's talk about the plot to this film. If you don't already know, the script to Justice League Mortal leaked online in 2013. There'll be a link in the description for anyone who wants to read it. But I'm going to give a brief and somewhat dramatic overview of what the story was going to be. The film opens with a funeral sequence, one with all of the various members of the League together in mourning. All of the League are present here except for Batman, and wearing all black versions of their traditional costumes. As a coffin is placed into the grave, the story flashes back two days ago. Batman has finished working on a surveillance satellite which he calls Brother Eye. Meanwhile in Denver, Colorado, Martian Manhunter is investigating a crime scene which catches fire after Johns came into contact with a seahorse-like creature, only to be saved by The Flash and Wonder Woman, who establish that the Justice League has existed for some time and that these heroes are all familiar with one another. The heroes, with the help of Superman, inspect Manhunter, who, as a result of the incident, is repeatedly setting on fire, deducing that whoever orchestrated the attack was aware of his weaknesses, with Superman travelling to Atlantis to question Aquaman, who begrudgingly offers his aid. Bruce Wayne hosts a dinner party at Wayne Manor, where he's greeted by Maxwell Lord, an entrepreneur who owns a chain of successful superhero-themed fast food restaurants named Planet Krypton, before the pair are interrupted by the appearance of Talia al Ghul. Batman later rescues two GCPD officers from a gang of thugs, before one of them transforms into an armoured cyborg known as Omak. Batman manages to escape and return to the Batcave, only to discover that Brother Eye has become self-aware, and is unable to use it. We then see various members of the League attacked in a manner sought to target their own weaknesses. Batman assembles the League and reveals that Brother Eye was created to devise contingency plans against his fellow teammates, which have been stolen and used against them. The team manage to repair their injuries and Flash begins to research their attacks at Planet Krypton with the help of his nephew, Wally West. Wally discovers a failed military project named OMAC, which focuses on nanotechnology and robotics but then shifted its focus to mind control. Barry and Wally learned that several children were experimented on in order to see if humans could be turned into psychic warriors, 
soldiers with the ability to control the enemy were just the power of their minds. All of the children in the OMAC project died except one, Jonah Wilkes. Wally runs a picture of Wilkes through a forensic aging program to see what he would look like today. And the result they discover is Maxwell Lord. Meanwhile, Superman, Batman and Wonder Woman follow Talia al Ghul to Lord's hideout where he activates Brother Eye's phase one protocol and using his own psychic powers, mind controls Superman, forcing the Man of Steel to attack Wonder Woman. The League assembles to subdue the Man of Steel to little avail, with Lord's mind control proving impossible to break. Superman manages to overpower the combined strength of the Justice League, and is prepared to execute Wonder Woman on Lord's command. With little choice, Batman is forced to snap Lord's neck, killing him and freeing Superman. However, it's revealed that Brother Eye's phase one protocol had launched the OMAC virus into nanobots nested in planet Krypton's fast food, turning anyone who had eaten it into mindless soldiers, and that Lord had actually backed up his brain pattern into the satellite, which captures the Flash and begins to transform him into OMAC Ultra. The League attempts to save Barry while fighting the OMAC soldiers, with Flash's wife, Iris West, rescued by Wally who is revealed to also be a speedster. Barry, unable to fight back against OMAC's mind control, merges with the speed force and forces OMAC Ultra and Lord's control into oblivion alongside himself. As Barry wills himself further into the speed force, he notices Wally running alongside him. Wally tells Barry that running faster will tear apart the molecules in his body and kill him. Barry is aware of this and gives Wally a determined but comfortable look ultimately succumbing to his wounds in the Speed Force and dying, sacrificing himself to save everyone. We cut back to the original sequence of the film at the funeral, where it's revealed that we are mourning Barry Allen, as Wally West takes his place alongside the fellow heroes as a new member of the Justice League. So, there is clearly a lot to digest here. The film's 128-page script manages to pack in a lot with many elements borrowed from Tower of Babel, but also Superman's sacrifice, identity crisis, and even crisis on infinite Earths. The screenwriters clearly had a real affinity for DC Comics, and wanted this film to include as much of the JLA's greatest hits as possible, which is in itself a problem, but it's clear the script still needed some major work. However, in November 2007, the Writers Guild of America strike took place, pushing any amendments on the screenplay back 14 weeks into December 2008, and ultimately dragging the film behind schedule. Once production resumed in February, they encountered another problem. You see, director George Miller had opted to shoot the film in his native Australia, seeking to take advantage of the nation's new tax incentives for film production. Despite casting several Australians in key roles within the film, and a production crew comprised mostly of Australian natives, the film was deemed eligible to claim the proposed 40% rebate. Miller was noticeably frustrated by this decision, stating that a once in a lifetime opportunity for the Australian film industry is being frittered away because of very lazy thinking. And as a result, Warner Brothers were forced to move the production to Vancouver, with principal photography now pushed back to July 2008. Despite facing many delays, production on Justice League Mortal battled on, with sets and props being constructed while the cast arrived and tested their new costumes. Unfortunately, by this point, Warner Brothers' concern for the project had grown too large to ignore, and after the smash success of Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, the studio had lost faith in his continuously delayed team-up, resulting in the studio shutting down production entirely merely days before principal photography was set to begin. While the downfall of Justice League Mortal could be attributed to the writer's strike or to Miller and Warner Brothers disagreements over filming locations, one could argue that it was the Dark Knight which put the nail firmly in the coffin, and Nolan's triumph not only guaranteed a third Batman film, but also caused the studio to look at him as the new linchpin for their DC film projects, aiming to use the success of the Dark Knight to launch other standalone movies which followed suit in a similar vein with the studio announcing a Green Lantern film, while also hiring Batman Begins screenwriter David S. Goya to work on a new take on Superman. And while Green Lantern failed to impress audiences and critics, upon its eventual 2011 release, Warner Brothers was hopeful that their new take on Superman would be a hit, 
hiring Christopher Nolan to oversee production, and bringing in 300 and Watchmen director Zack Snyder to bring this new take on The Last Son of Krypton to life, a decision that would change the course of DC's entire cinematic universe and embark us on a path that led to a dawn of justice. Thank you so much for watching today's video everyone, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to leave a like on the video and also make sure to leave a comment down below as well. Let me know what your thoughts are regarding Justice League Mortal, would you like to have seen it and do you think it would have been better or worse than the Justice League film we actually got? Stay tuned for a new video coming in two weeks time where we're going to be looking at Will Beale's Justice League script from 2013 and how that paved the way for Zack Snyder and Josh Whedon to bring us the Justice League movie that we ultimately received. If you want some more videos like the one you're watching right now, there will be some on screen. And if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. We make videos discussing the best of comic books, cinema and everything in between. And if you want some more of me, you can follow me on Twitter, just at OwenLikesComics. That's all for me, and I will see you all next time. So until then, take care, and keep reading.